Accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and you will be saved. Now other false teachers, especially most televangelists you see today, teach a prosperity gospel, a health and wealth message. They teach that God wants you to be rich and that if you're not rich, it's because you do not have enough faith. Salvation is rarely mentioned, if ever, in their so-called sermons. Of course, they want you to mail your seed faith money to them and give you their address in exchange for some miracle prayer cloth or some miracle water and a little bitty tiny vial that they said come from the Jordan River. That is wrong and it is very damaging to individual Christians and to Christianity as a whole. These false teachers. That is why doctrine, a lot of people hate the name doctrine. We told you a couple of weeks ago, doctrine is simply a biblical truth explained in a way that people can understand it. But that is why doctrine is so vital. You must read and study the Bible for yourself and listen to good Bible-based preaching so that you can recognize these wolves in sheep's clothing. So many people are so gullible because they're so lazy, they do not read and understand for themselves. They're hurting so bad, they're hungry for something, for that hole that's in their heart, put there by God Himself so that He can fill it. That they're willing to listen to anything. And they fall for this garbage. We must read and understand the Bible and not fall prey to these wolves. Of course, there are others who teach that nothing bad will ever happen to a faithful Christian under the care of God. In the same way, if you do not have enough faith, then bad things can happen to you. Of course, any Christian who reads the Bible for himself will discover that there is no truth in that. Christians will suffer for many reasons, but we won't go into all of that today. It is enough to know that just because you are a believer doesn't mean you won't suffer hardship. I don't care what Joel Osteen says with his thousand dollar smile. Now the second question was this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? The answer to that question was just as obvious as the first. The Galatians, the Gentiles, had no law. The law had been given to the Jews and for the Jews. They certainly didn't have any laws that had anything to do with the God of the Bible and the God of creation, let alone on how to live according to His righteousness. Most of them did not even believe in the existence of such a God. They had all these other gods made of wood and stone, gods made from their own hands, from their own imaginations. Exception being the God-fearers and the proselytes. These were those who came to the outer courts of the temple to listen and to learn. And those who underwent circumcision and converted to the Jewish faith. But they had accepted the Jewish law. But just like the natural born Jew, the law is not what saved them. It was by grace through faith that they were saved. A free gift from God that not of works that anyone could boast. Paul's rhetorical question was designed to focus their attention on that fact. By grace you have been saved through faith. The third question was having begun by the Spirit. Are you now being perfected by the flesh? What Paul was attempting to point out with that question was that since their Conversion was made possible by the Spirit working through faith and hearing. It must surely be that the Spirit is what is required to be sanctified. Progressively sanctified. You'll recall, you are sanctified when you believed. You are set apart. That is positional sanctification. But then as you get cleaned up by reading His Word and walking in obedience, you are being progressively sanctified. An ultimate sanctification we call glorification. 
when we will be made perfect because He is perfect. When our disembodied souls, if we're already passed on, will be reunited with our resurrected bodies, we will be perfect and glorified and no sinful thought will ever enter our minds again. God, I look forward to that day. But if they were able to be saved by the works of the law or good deeds, what made them think they could build on the foundation of the cross based on their own, own human strength and abilities that they were unable to be saved by those things. The truth of the matter is they can't and neither can we. We all need the help of the Holy Spirit to keep going because we will only drift away from holiness if left to our own devices, our own strength. We cannot do it on our own. If they were able to do that, they wouldn't have needed a spirit's assistance to begin with. Now that brings us to the fourth question, which is, did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? All three of Paul's known missionary journeys took him through the region of Galatia. You remember... We've talked about Galatia, Little France, the Gauls, and all that when we began this series. There he preached and started many churches in the area of Galatia. In Acts 14, 19 through 22, we learn about something that happened to Paul on his first missionary journey and the warnings he gave his fellow Christians. I'm going to read it if you want to go there. That's fine, Acts. Chapter 14. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Who wrote Acts? Luke did. Chapter 14, verses 19 through 22. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city. And on the next day he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Paul was stoned and left for dead because of his beliefs and his preaching. He wanted his fellow believers. He warned them that they too would suffer for their new belief in Christ. That passage dispels the teaching of modern day preachers who teach that Christianity is a bed of roses. It is not. Another passage that clearly reveals such suffering for the faith is found in Hebrews chapter 11, the faith chapter. Turn there. I wish I had time to read the whole chapter today, but I won't. I encourage you to read it later today. I would say read it sometime this week. We may not have a week. The rapture may come first. It's imminent at any time. Read it today. Hebrews 11. Go ahead and turn there. We're going to begin with the second half of verse 35. Be 35b. I just want you to picture in your mind what these believers had to go through. And remember, all scripture is theopnustos. It is God breathed, it is accurate, it is the truth. Some were tortured refusing to accept release so that they might arise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy wandering about in deserts, in mountains, and in dens and caves. 
of the earth. We'll stop there. Stone saw in two, killed with the sword. You see by those verses that Christians will and do suffer persecution. If the world rejected Jesus and spat on Him and refused to listen to Him and killed Him on a Roman cross, what makes you think the world would treat you any better? We are blessed here in the United States. Even though this country is no longer a Christian nation, we are still generally safe to come to church and worship. And your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Hebrews 12.4 Now what do I mean we aren't a Christian nation anymore? Well, I'll tell you. The Bible and Jesus Christ no longer have pride of place in this nation. It has been marginalized. For example, all of our major universities, Harvard, Yale, all of them were founded as evangelical Christian schools. They are now secular and worldly to an extreme, filling the heads of their students with secularism. Even many of our seminaries today turn out preachers with a liberal, non-Bible-based theology that God of Jesus might not have been divine. He was a very wise rabbi. It's all garbage. Jesus was the Son of God. We have removed God from our schools, our courthouses, our public squares, and most other institutions. We have legalized gay marriage and murdered innocent babies by the millions and call it a woman's choice. We have ostracized Christian behavior. The pagan holiday of Halloween, which will be celebrated tomorrow, is growing by millions of dollars each year while the true meaning of Christmas is being marginalized. Christmas has become so commercialized that even believers are more focused on the latest trends than on a gift that was given to us 2,000 years ago. It is ironic that in a survey, a very recent survey, around 75% of Americans identified themselves as Christians. I don't believe it for a minute. They're lying. If that were true, there would be no abortion and gay marriage in this nation. There would still be prayers in school and evolution would not be taught as the truth and creationism denied. And Christmas would be about Christ. Atheists like Christopher Hitchens, Richard Dawkins and Bill Maher, you've seen him on TV, would not be given the press and the TV shows that they are given. And mainstream media would not be a bunch of liars Covering up the truth the way they do. They only tell the side of the story they want you to hear. And it is not the Christian viewpoint. You're lucky whenever a little bit of it sneaks through. Jeffress was on there. And what do they do with him preaching the truth? They ridicule him and besmirch him. Trying to tear down a political candidate because of something he said which was the truth. If we were a Christian nation, we would not have a president who apologizes to the radical Islamic world for the so-called sins of this Christian nation and who takes sides against Israel. If we are against Israel, we are on the wrong side of history and the wrong side of God. Yes, Israel is secular right now. It's a Zionist Israel. But God is not finished with them. He will fulfill every promise He made to them. As a church, I believe that we will be raptured out before that time. But we must be on the side of Israel. Those are Jews over there for the very first time in history now. There are more Jews in Israel proper than there are even in the United States. That just flopped a few years ago. There were more here, now there's more over there. 